Every now and then, we like to try something a little bit different on land and sea. This is going to be one of those times. For today, we have a program about two women who fish for a living. Now, that in itself is a bit different, for we don't usually find women out on the fishing grounds. Well, finally, we did. There they were, two women dressed in rubber clothes, fishing away in the Strait of Belle Isle. Could we do a program about them? Well, why not? So we stayed a few extra days. It would prove to be more than the story about two women out fishing, though. It would prove to be a story of guts and determination, of love and devotion, of hard work and sacrifice. And it would prove to be a heartwarming experience for all of us as we filmed the story of Mary and Josephine MacDonald. Mary and Jose live on the southern coast of Labrador, the Labrador Straits, people here call it, just across from the tip of Newfoundland's northern peninsula, in a community called West St. Modest. West St. Modest is like hundreds of other places in this province. It began as a fishing station, and people here must still look to the sea for their livelihood. And here in West St. Modest, in this house, lived the MacDonald family. A family like many other families in Newfoundland and Labrador. A family that's had its ups and downs, its good times and bad. A family, as I say, like many others. But you may have already noticed one difference. There's only one male to be seen, one man in the family. All the rest are girls. There's Frank's wife, Alice. Their daughters, Mary, Josephine, Kathleen, Elsie, Alice, Pauline, Ruby, Annie, Ellen. Yes, Frank and Alice MacDonald have all girls, nine of them, not a boy in the family. Now, given the right circumstances, that can be a blessing. But to a young fisherman like Frank MacDonald, struggling to make a living back in the hungry 30s, a string of girls can be tough luck. You needed strapping young fellows in the boat with you. Even then, it was hard to make a dollar. When the fishery failed, you failed. Then it was a matter of scraping by. Subsistence living, they call it. Making your own clothes, cutting your own wood, getting food wherever you could. Times were hard. Frank told me about going out as a 10-year-old to fish with his uncle. Cold, wet, hungry, seasick. He would turn to anything just to survive. He once rinded a hundred logs of wood for two gallons of molasses. Yet Frank MacDonald is the luckiest man in the world. He told me so himself. Times may have been tough, but that just made the little you had taste all the better. And the girls? Well, that didn't turn out to be a problem after all. But the two oldest, Mary and Jose, joined their father in the boat when they were young girls. In a way, I suppose, they became his sons. Mary is now the skipper. She's been fishing since the age of 13. Then a few years later, Josephine was by her side. Frank goes out every now and then for company and to lend a hand, but only when they really need it. It's their boat, they do the work. They make the decisions. They took over when their father became sick a few years back. And now they're as good as any man. Any time from May till October, you may find them out here on the fishing grounds, trawling, jigging, hand lining, setting and hauling their gill nets. When we were there, it was late July. The salmon run was just about over, and codfish were still scarce. To make matters worse, the windy weather had filled the nets with kelp and other seaweed. And then, on top of all that, the water was full of slug. The nets were in an awful mess. It's the sort of thing fishermen everywhere have to put up with at one time or another. But it seems to have been especially bad here in the Straits in recent years. Nothing to do, take them home and pick them clean again. Mary and Joe's fish for cod with gill nets in the summer, and later they'll use trawl. 
and sometimes they jig. One year, when they were very young, they jigged 180 cantles of fish. They fish for salmon, they fish for herring, they fish for whatever they can sell. They're out whenever it's fit to be out. They take the bad with the good. This is their life. Despite all the kelp and slob, there's a bit of fish to put away when they get home. Not much, but it all helps. You don't need a lot of fish to make a dollar these days. There's been no market for fresh fish here in the Straits, so Mary and Joe salt all they catch. When landings are low, this is a more profitable way to operate. At least it's supposed to be. Two summers ago, they had a dispute over the way their fish was graded. They figure they lost $1,000 in the deal. A hard blow. They're still a bit bitter about it. Dump all that. I dump all that. Joe splits, Mary cuts throats and heads the fish. They put up herring too, when there's any about. One year they sold 20,000 pounds. Over the years, Mary and Joe have had some misunderstandings with government officials, but these have all gradually been ironed out. Well, it's understandable, I suppose. Mary and Joe aren't your typical crew. I suppose it's hard for people in offices a thousand miles away to really believe that women are out there fishing. Maybe they'll believe it now. When the wind comes up, when the girls can't get out in boat, it doesn't mean they're idle. As every fisherman knows, there's a hundred things to be done ashore on the slack days, especially in a year like this, when the water is so dirty. And even if all the work is done on the fish and with the nets, there's still the garden to tend. There's a nice patch of ground they've built up between the house and the cliffs. Their mother, Alice, does most of the work in the garden, but Mary and Joe's help out whenever they can break away from the fishery.
On the other side of the house is the wood pile, the sawhorse, and the chopping block. The stage, the store, well now that's something to behold. So clean, so tidy. The woman's touch, I suppose. It's in here that they knit and mend the twine and get ready for the fishery. This too is part of a fisherwoman's life. Tell me something, now, it's not often you see women in the boat. How did you ever get started in the fishing boat? Well, I got started when I was 13 years old. First, I used to go to Jim and I was the father, and he got sick, and I gave it up for a few years. And then I said, well, I never got nothing else to go at. I had to make a living somehow. I'm not a very good fisherman, but I managed to do something with it, and I survived. And I went out the end, and then I decided one year, I said I'd get a boat. I got to meet the first time I started, I had near here and get near a salmon. So I got a salmon, and here I went to the fish, and I got five minutes, and just paid so much that he got them, but I got them paid off that year. I ate, I ended up at eight near it. And salmon, I only had one salmon, but. Don't you find it a hard life? No, I enjoy it, I love it. I've got to be a good time to be on the land. What about Joe? Well, I she hasn't been fishing as long, but what do you think? Well, I think it's a good life. I think there's all the fresh air that you can get on the water. When you're on the land, well, the time is so long, and then if you got a job, when well, you're buried in all the time. You tried other things. You had a store and everything, but you'd rather be, you'd rather be on the water. Well, I used to go to the boat with Dad, but I used to get seasick all the time. And then I had to give it up, but I used to help them when they come in, you know, like split it and head it firm and solve it and things like that. Mary, I was wondering, you know, your father had no sons, you had no, no brothers. Uh, was this why you went fishing? Did, did you have to go fishing in a way, or did you go by choice? No, I didn't have to go fishing in a way, not first when I started. I just went in for the fun. But then after four or five years, I got in the rest. When I got interested, I just couldn't leave it. Just the way you've been ever since. Did you get up in the morning, 4 o'clock, and you go out every day and it's fit to go out? We get up in the morning around 4 o'clock and leave now 5, half past 5, some mornings late, and that all came to the and so I didn't have your family one day or another. Do you depend on your father very much now? Well, not so much as we did in the first week. First of all, he would, you know, go down and make me into a mix and things like that, but not so much now. We say we get more like we're on our own now. We had Every three years, you learned a bit more. Yeah. Who's the skipper in the boat? Are you the skipper there? Well, I suppose there's something. I don't know if the skipper or not, but I guess you I'm too pretty boss. good. Have you ever had any discrimination? Any, anybody treat you unfairly because you're women? Yeah, no, and yes. There's a few. I didn't have any problems so far. I got along good with people. And one year they had a program over here for men flying. I got in with them and 
I was there for a week, six weeks, something like that. I never had a good problem with it. And Joseph's pretty good player, isn't he? Oh, yes, Joseph's solid face. Just better. And, and you, you do, do up some herring, too, I believe. Yeah, we do a nice bit of herring. Last year we sold the price. And but this year now we're trying to sell it in our own barrel for the Southwest collaboration. But herring is scared to you, no herring at all. A couple of years back we had 60 barrels. And last year we had, I don't know, 18 or 20,000 pounds herring. But this year we got nothing. But five barrels now so far for the whole summer. It's not bad, kind of June. But there's still lots of time, still lots of hope that it'll be a good year. Well, for the hearing, yes, the last time because they usually get around 15 of August and then they'll last up then probably some years till 15 of October. And the codfish, we usually get them, you know, around the first part of June. And then we'll say it's about the middle part of June. Well, fish will slack off or something like that. But those late years, they don't get known in June. Most of them dig around last July, first part of August. And around last July, we get, you know, in June, it's in August, we have getting fat and dig it. Probably take it you know, up until the middle of September until the weather gets bad. It's not all work, though, for in the nighttime there's the endless stories of their father and his friends who drop in to talk about the fishery and to remember the old times. Frank is a great storyteller and a wonderful wit. He can entertain for hours. This is John Cabot, a neighbor and friend of the family. But he's not the only one to drop in on the McDonald's. It doesn't take long to get a kitchen racket going here. Yes, the floor at McDonald's has known a scuff or two. Any excuse will do. Tonight is Frank and Alice's anniversary. Winter comes to West St. Modest. A bitter wind whistles through the straits. The wood stove cackles gaily inside the McDonald home. It's snug and warm inside. But Mary and Joe aren't there. They're on their way to the woods to cut some firewood. It may be cold and windy on the coast. Here in the woods, it's still nippy, but at least you're sheltered from the wind. But I suppose with the work these girls have in mind, they don't worry about getting cold anyway. The wood Mary and Joe's cut now in the wintertime will keep the home fire burning all year round. A lot of people these days are getting back to wood stoves and are cutting their own firewood. Mary and Joe's and lots of other people in this province have never gotten away from it. This is the way it's always been.
And so Mary and Joseph McDonald passed a winter's day in the woods back of West St. Modest, chopping, limbing, pausing once in a while for a smoke under a wintry sky. The days are short though in winter. Before they knew it, it was time to load up and head for home. The woods back of West St. Modest are getting cut out, forcing the girls to cut some pretty small sticks, and sometimes to move further back in the country. With pickup trucks and snow toboggans, this is no longer much of a problem. And so the McDonald girls, Mary and Jules, follow the seasons here on the coast of Labrador. Follow the pattern of life that's been established over the years, in the woods, on the sea, in the garden. It's a life many here on the Atlantic coast have known, and many still know. But most who know it are men, and many of them have forgotten. Spring is coming again to West St. Modest. It will soon be time for the McDonald's to launch their boat again and steam out the bay. Jost will be there again. And Frank, if he's well enough, will go along to keep the girls company. Mary will be skipper again, hoping that the kelp and slob won't be back to plague them. Hoping that the longliners won't be fishing in so close to shore this year. Last year she figured some of them must have gotten bake apple stalks in their nets they were in so close. They'll be out setting and hauling their salmon nets, their cod nets, their herring nets. They'll be jigging and trawling, doing their best to earn what they can from the sea. They've ruled out the possibility of getting a bigger boat themselves but they're scared that the growing fleet of longliners will close them in, cut off the fish. They'd like to see smaller boats like themselves get some degree of protection on the fishing grounds. Actually, Mary would love to see Gilnet's banned completely. Everyone turned to trawl and line fishing. Last year, the fishery wasn't too good for the McDonald girls. But like fishermen everywhere, they've learned to take the lean years with the good. Perhaps this year will be better. Perhaps this year there'll be lots of salmon and herring and codfish. At least the prices are good. That's one thing that keeps them going. As I watched Mary and Joe's fishing, I couldn't help but wonder what a wonderful thing it would be if these girls could market other species. Lumpfish spawn, for instance, would be an easy and lucrative fishery for them. And there are certainly other species that could be developed here too. What a tremendous difference it would make to the small boats now fighting over a dwindling resource and hemmed in by bigger boats. Right now it is a bit of a struggle for the McDonald girls. You've got to admire their courage, their pluck. And there's a lot of other things to admire in these girls and what they've done too. I watched them with their parents picking away at the kelp infested nets. A tiresome, thankless job. It struck me that this is quite a family. Filming them, being with them, sharing a bit of their lives was a heartwarming experience for me and for the land and sea crew. They're all home right now, the McDonald's are. Cutting firewood, getting their boat ready, in the store, working at the nets, arguing about the fishery, listening to Frank's stories. Or maybe they're all sitting down together in the front room, watching this television show about themselves. It's been a long wait. I hope they've liked it.